series from the Department of Critical Theory and Social Justice. I'm Professor Christianakis, and I'm joined by my colleagues in the department, Professor Moazam Dolat and Professor Heldman. In, uh, first, a bit about the series. The, the series focuses on pressing current events and seeks to connect our community with experts, scholars, artists, and the most effective activists to help us understand the causes of problems we face and what we can do to address them. This summer, our series will address two main crises, the complex and far-reaching effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and political violence, in particular, the violence of US police forces against black people and its deep roots and broad effects in our society. Ne just a heads up, next Wednesday, July 15th, we will host Soraya Shamali. She's gonna talk to us about gender injustice and the COVID pandemic. These colloquia will be continue, through, will continue throughout the summer and the registration links for the descriptions for future events as well as video of the past events are available at our series website, oxy.edu slash matrix. You can also follow us and the series on Instagram and CTSJ Oxy. Please note we are using a webinar format that means that you can submit your questions at any time via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. William Lee. He might not know this, but I've been following him for the last seven years. Uh, he is a rock star in the, in the community of cancer patients who are using food to help heal. Um, Dr. Lee is a world-renowned physician, scientist, and New York Times best-selling author of Eat to Beat Disease. I have that book. It's called, it, the subtitle is The New Science of How Your Body Can Heal Itself. Um, he's the president of the global nonprofit, the Angiogenesis Foundation. Dr. Lee, Lee's work has impacted more than 50 million people worldwide and has led to new treatments for cancer, vision loss, and diabetes. He really is amazing. Dr. Lee regularly appears in the media as a top expert on the cutting edge of food and health and has been featured in the Oz Show, the Dr. Oz Show, Rachel Ray, Live with Kelly and Ryan, CNN, CNBC, Voice of America, and many other programs. His work has also been featured in USA Today, Time, The Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, O Magazine, and NPR. He received his undergraduate degree with honors in biochemistry from Harvard College and his medical degree from the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He completed his clinical training in general internal medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Dr. Lee co-authored a recent COVID-19 related study published in the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm so happy to be able to present him today. Well, thank you, uh, Mary. It's a real pleasure to address your uh, audience and to really talk about uh, a topic that has impacted all of us, and that's really the impact of COVID-19. I thought I would bring a, a fresh perspective on this since we um, have heard so much about the problems of testing and the uh, issues of social distancing. And I thought I would bring it home in a way that touches all of us in a very day-to-day, -day, like three times a day way, which is, you know, what should we eat in the COVID era? And more specifically, how do we think about the food that we might actually um, buy at the market, put in our uh, a pantry or refrigerator or, or on our stovetop um, that can actually help us be healthier. And so with that, let me just kind of begin by um, uh, uh, sharing with you a um, image that we all um, love to see, which is jumping for joy, our entire community together, uh, uh, closer than uh, six feet apart and without masks. And obviously this is the same type of joy that uh, I hope to return to as quickly as possible. Um, but we're actually facing a very different scenario that changed suddenly uh, really at the beginning of this year. And I wanted to share with you a little perspective because uh, on New Year's Eve uh, 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 earlier this year, uh, there was sort of this mass world celebration. And it's just helpful, I think, for us to remember how our community really uh, was able to enjoy uh, celebrating uh, uh, being together and doing good things. Uh, this is a picture from London, uh, fireworks display, tens of thousands of people gathered around the, the River Thames uh, to really um, celebrate uh, together. Here is Russia. Look at those crowds in front of the Kremlin celebrating together and looking at these amazing fireworks. Um, this is Paris. Um, for those of you who've actually had the 
uh, privilege of going there. This is the Champs Elysees, the big avenue that goes to uh, the Arc of Triomphe, uh, and those red. Uh, 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 lights are really a whole arbor of trees lining that, but you, you see tens of thousands of people lined up, packed together side by side, um, singing and, and chanting. And, and, um, and of course, here we are in Times Square in the U.S., you know, celebrating together only as Americans really know how uh, to, to ring in the new year as a ball drops. And so I just wanted to kind of frame what I'm about to tell you, really with the context that it wasn't so long ago that uh, we we really just had our lives and we want that back again. So how do we go from where we are today back to capture a bit of what we had, and at least in terms of thinking about things that we can do for ourselves? And I'm, I'm going to I'm going to actually talk about things like vaccines and treatments and things like that. But, you know, one of the things that we do to celebrate uh, is actually have food together. That's actually a really central part of our community. It's central to who we are as individuals, um, where we came from, how we grew up, the cultures and communities uh, that we emerged from. And that's really something that is really deeply personal. So here it is. What you're looking at is the uh, virus that actually causes COVID-19, that black splotch in the middle. Uh, if you actually um, lean back from your screen and squint, you'll actually see these spikes coming out from the sides, the periphery, uh, the perimeter of that dark black splotch. That gray lump to the left is actually a blood cell. And this is actually what the virus looks like inside the human body next to a blood cell about to do some damage uh, to it. And I'm gonna talk about this in a second as well, but I wanted you to see the enemy because otherwise just to read about it, hear about it and fear it, you know, uh, is it makes it kind of a conceptual thing. And I always feel it's helpful to know exactly what we're actually uh, dealing with. And this is it. This is actually the virus. Um, amazingly, and I'm sure you guys have seen this uh, chart many times over, but I, I, I took a look at this yesterday. Amazingly, almost 12 million cases. And you can see the red patterns uh, on this world map pretty much. Um, the entire world's been affected by this. And in the United States, uh, more than 130,000 uh, deaths uh, worldwide, more than half a million deaths. So, you know, this is not the most devastating pandemic that the planet has ever seen or mankind has ever seen, but it's getting up there. And, you know, what we want to do, what we need to do to act as a community is to actually make that red coloring disappear. So you see that gray colors of the countries in the background. That's what we want. We want to get back to that. Now, the United States actually is a standout. Um, you know, we are so good in so many different things, but I think this chart actually says a lot, which is starting from January, remember I showed you the pictures of New Year, and then going all the way up to July 7th, so that's, you know, yesterday, you can see China where, you know, this pandemic uh, emanated from started is, you know, kind of uh, like on a level peak, pretty low down, Canada, uh, low down, Italy, which, you know, we, we, we saw these horrible pictures of Italy, um, they actually are on their way down in terms of cases. Uh, um, uh, Russia going up, Brazil, as we know, is a really uh, troubled area in Latin America that, you know, we all should try to figure out how to actually help them. Cases going sky high, but I want you to see the U.S. is the leader of the pack globally. Now, there's so many things that we lead in, we should not be leading in COVID-19 cases. So I want you to sort of all think about that in terms of what role we have and what, how we can actually all uh, uh, help to, uh, uh, this is now time to flatten the curve again um, in a very serious way. Okay, so let's um, take a look at the, um, uh, what I really wanted to share with you is that the situation we're in now is not a new situation. Pandemics have actually been with us, you know, um, uh, for thousands of years. And the last major, major, major one was the plague, the bubonic plague, which, you know, 400 years ago in Venice, Italy, people started seeing um, uh, uh, people dying around them citizens dying around them. And so they took their families, they ran in Venice, uh, Italy, inside their stone homes, you know, huddling, hiding away, um, uh, not really sure what was going to happen here. And everybody was waiting for the town crier to tell them that it was safe to go back out into the village square again. So if that sounds familiar to you, uh, what's, what's amazing to me as I was going through this, like everyone else, is how little we've changed as humans. 
in communities. When we see something that's scary, first thing we do is run into our homes. Uh, this picture actually s says a lot because that figure in the middle <clears throat> with that um, bird-like mask is actually a doctor. In fact, they call that bird mask the doctor's mask um, in Venetian art. And in, during the, um, uh, the Carnavale, which is the famous celebration, it's like the Mardi Gras of Italy, um, many people would actually wear this mask. But back in the time of the plague, doctors were, would wander around the streets wearing this mask and they'd fill the beak with herbs that smelled good because they actually thought that um, the plague might actually be in the air. So again, I just want to show you masking, hiding out, being homebound, locked down, waiting for people to say when it was time to reopen is not new. We've been there before, so we can actually beat this again. And the way we're going to beat it really is um, not by chance. We're going to beat it with science. And I'm a physician. I'm a scientist. You know, I'm actually a COVID researcher. And I'm going to tell you, you know, what we're doing, what's actually happening around the community uh, uh, to actually beat this thing. So the first thing is to understand what's going on. And uh, the virus that causes COVID is called a coronavirus, as everybody knows. Uh, and uh, I think I just heard uh, yesterday that it's abbreviated as Rona. And uh, it's a respiratory virus. And in the beginning, we actually said, oh, it's kind of like a bad flu. In fact, the influenza, influenza, the flu, is actually caused by the influenza virus, whereas the common cold is actually caused by the corona virus. And so COVID-19 caused by this coronavirus is, has nothing to do with the flu. It's not a bad flu. It's not a good flu. It's not even the flu. It's actually kind of related to the cold. And we know colds are transmitted really easily by coughing and sneezing. If you think, uh, you know, just over your childhood or, you know, if you're riding public transportation or sitting on an airplane or in a park with somebody who's coughing and sniffling or at a party where somebody's actually sick, that's how, you, that's how easy it is to get the cold. So um, not the flu. It's more similar to the cold, but a really, really bad and dangerous cold it is. So colds, all coronaviruses are respiratory viruses, which means that we breathe them in. So this is basically how it goes. They're wafting through the air in respiratory droplets. And that's really one of the important things that we're thinking about now is that we can't get this virus into our body unless we breathe it in. Now, some people have reported it might get into your eyes and, and you know, if it gets on your, if you touch something with it and you touch your face, if you touch your mouth, it might get into, or rub your nose, it might get into the mucous membranes. But at the end of the day, this virus is inhaled. And once it gets into your body, it actually uh, has to fight its way through our immune system. I'm going to talk about that in just a little bit, because this is really where food might be able to help us fight back. But because it's a respiratory virus, I mean, this is really why uh, we, we need to um, uh, uh, take measures like wearing a mask. Uh, if we're wearing a mask uh, and, uh, and everyone else is wearing a mask, then if the thing is in the air by respiratory droplets, this is not a blame game. It doesn't matter who actually has it. If it's in the air, we're not going to inhale it. And if we have it, we're not going to blow it out to somebody else. And so in other countries around the world, there is a real sense of civic responsibility, community duty. And, you know, in the United States, we have a good sense of community too. So it's not only about yourself, it's about what we can do for our community around us. And, you know, for schools, I'm involved with some school reopening programs as sort of a health advisor. And the question is, isn't, you know, whether we should open schools up or not. Of course, we should open up schools. It's the question is really, how can we do this so it's safe for faculty? How can we do this so it's safe for students? How can we make it safe so that students going home or faculty going home are actually safe to be with their own fam family members? And of course, schools have lots of uh, people that come in and out all the time, whether they're um, people that are hired by the school to help with food services, whatnot. Um, I want to show you um, this picture about the banana. And even though she's wearing a glove in this picture, there is no evidence, zero evidence, that, this, that COVID-19 is transmitted by food. It has not been, okay, in the beginning, they thought it was in a wet market and somebody ate a bat. But in point of fact, now that this is out there, you know, if you think about it, it's out in Italy, it's out in France, it's out in Russia, it's out all the United States and South America. Nobody has been documented to actually ca catch COVID-19 by getting it through their food. So that's good news. It means that food is actually a safe way for us to actually uh, uh, stay uh, healthy. The other thing is social distancing and whether you're talking about a school or a restaurant or 
or um, frankly, an airplane. Uh, this is this is kind of the equation that's now being uh, uh, crunched in uh, everybody who's responsible for other people. Uh, we don't have the exact answers yet, uh, but it's really interesting to think through um, how do we remain close together as a community and yet separated so that we're safe, and at least until a vaccine actually arrives. Now, I talked to you about this is a respiratory virus. And the reason we need to actually wear masks and prevent ourselves from getting infected is because once this virus gets into our lungs, unfortunately is not just uh, a respiratory virus. It doesn't only cause a pneumonia. Um, uh, and not everybody gets a pneumonia. Some people actually just get kind of like flu cold-like symptoms, but you can actually um, uh, uh, get a really bad pneumonia. So bad, you gotta go to the hospital and what we found is actually this virus, once it gets in your lungs, will make a beeline for blood vessels and actually start to get around your body. And it can heart, attack your heart. It can attack your eyes. It can attack your kidneys. It can attack your liver. Uh, it's even been found in the brain. And even your intestines, even your gut, seems to be able to shed the virus. And so you really don't, nobody wants this virus in their body. That's why something as simple as a mask makes a heck of a lot of sense. Now, the brain is really involved too. Um, if you know anybody who's actually had COVID and recovered. Um, they might tell you that it's taken them a long time to feel themselves again. They don't have the same strength. Climbing stairs is difficult. Um, some people actually say that they've had brain fog. And I want to show you what actually happens. This is actually an MRI of a patient who, with COVID who actually has a lot of brain fog because right, this is, by the way, this is a slice of the brain. Those two little black balls on the top are the eyes. So what you're doing is having an eagle's eye view. If you, were, uh, if you imagine a pizza slice uh, or bologna slice um, uh, through a head. And the eyes there, you can see the, the lump of the nose um, in the middle and um, the, the uh, oval gray masses behind uh, that's got a little walnut in the middle, that is actually the brain. And those white spots that the arrows are pointing to are abnormal. These are abnormal lesions caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus as part of the brain manifestations of COVID-19. This is why it's not okay to just try to get the virus to get it over with. Nobody wants this in their body. You definitely don't want to give it to your grandmother or your spouse. The other thing that happens that uh, when this virus gets into their bloodstream is that it can actually make its way all the way down to your tippy toes. And some people who aren't even sick, who don't have a cough, who just have a fever, they're going going to the emergency room or they're going to their podiatrist or they're telling uh, the per people that were, you know, doing their, um, uh, uh, you know, painting their toes. They're like, you know, I got this problem. Like my feet really hurt. And look, up, look at how red my toes are. This is called COVID toe. And oftentimes it's actually what brings people to medical attention. And this redness is due to the blood vessels being inflamed by the virus itself. So you breathe it in, goes in your lung, causes a problem there, then it gets into your blood vessels and it spreads. The reason I'm actually sharing this kind of slightly scary picture to you is because five months ago, we had no idea what was going on. And as a doctor, I can tell you it's, it was frightening to me to see a disease and not know what was actually happening. Now that the medical community is sort of onto the virus and every day we're, every week we're peeling back the layer a little bit more, it gives us the ability to think about how do we actually treat this? How do we defeat this? How do we prevent this? And that's what's important. So um, about a month ago, uh, uh, my group at the Angiogenesis Foundation uh, got together uh, with some really amazing researchers and we said, while there are people that are looking at sort of the infectious component of COVID-19, we would take a look at what's happening at the blood vessels. Because remember I told you blood vessels are how they spread. And what we found was that this virus actually um, can infect the 60,000 miles worth of blood vessels in your body. So we really, really need to be able to protect ourselves. I'm telling you all this really because there's some good news, which is that our immune system is designed to fight off viruses. Um, uh, now we don't, we, we haven't seen our bodies, human bodies haven't seen COVID-19 until this past, you know, winter. And so we're, we're, our immune systems are just getting used to it and trying to figure out how to get around it, uh, how to thwart it. Uh, but our blood vessels are also really important. So what are we waiting for now? Okay. Uh, and I know you guys are all waiting to hear about the food part. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. Uh, we, we need a vaccine uh, waiting, uh, maybe next year. 
uh, we need effective treatments. There are two that have been actually been identified. One is a steroid, dexamethasone. One is remdesivir. Um, both actually uh, seem to be useful in people who are really, really, really sick. And that's not most of us. We, we just want to prevent the disease. Um, and then go, jumping down to the bottom, we can avoid it. So lockdown, except that nobody wants to stay locked down forever um, and hiding it um, and hiding, uh, which, you know, we, we can't hide either. So what we're left with that we can do something about is our immune defenses, because really our bodies are always, from the time we're born, at war with viruses because viruses are everywhere on the planet. You know, the moment, you know, um, we are brought home as babies in, uh, uh, in a, in a, in a, um, car seat uh, uh, from, the, from the hospital uh, uh, to, uh, to our home. The moment we go outside of the hospital, we are actually encounter our bodies are encountering viruses. So we, our body knows how to actually deal with viruses, and that's really our immune system. And in fact, we have a whole bunch of these hardwired health defenses in our body, and I just want to talk about some of them. Our blood vessels know how to defend themselves um, actually by bringing circulation. We have stem cells that can regenerate us from the inside out. Our gut health is a microbiome. Our DNA protects itself and our immune system is really where all the action is when it really becomes a time to think about how to just prevent ourselves from getting sick from in a, a virus like COVID-19. So I'm done talking about COVID-19. I'm not going to, now I'm going to tell you about food as medicine because that's really the good news part. I kind of gave you the reality check uh, of where we are. Now I'm going to tell you how, what we know about food as medicine to activate those health defenses, specifically our immune system, because that's really something that everybody's interested in. So prior to the pandemic, when we thought, when most of us thought about health, we thought about fitness, working out, you know, looking good, feeling good, beach body, you know, um, I, I used to jokingly call it, you know, juicing, jogging, and yoga were sort of the things that we thought about health. Now, everybody realizes how vulnerable we are or could be. So everybody wants a stronger immune system. We want to actually be strong and, and well defended from the inside out now. And this is how we can do it with food. So, you know, uh, you don't have to go very far to a farmer's market or to even to a grocery store, the produce section, to see all the amazing, colorful things that Mother Nature has produced for us. And yeah, we like things that are sweet. We like things that you know are juicy. Uh, we're used to things that our mom or grandma's cooked for us. Um, and you know, back in the day when restaurants were all the rage, you know, uh, we were counting on chefs to come up with stuff that was tasty for us to eat. But at the end of the day, look at this bounty, all that color, all that variety. All those flavors, that's what Mother Nature actually has created as the medicine cabinet in nature. And in fact, we've been able to look at the chemicals in food. So not artificial chemicals that we use for synthetic food manufacturing. We're talking about natural plant bioactives. They're called bioactives because they're chemicals that actually did something for the plant. They are biologically active. And most of the things that, um, most of these bioactives, which actually produce health in, in our bodies, actually uh, also defended the plant. So for example, some of them are natural pesticides. So mother nature's own pesticides would, this chemical would keep um, a, a pest from eating it. Uh, or they actually gave brilliant colors uh, or incredible odors or incredible color to attract bees to actually help to uh, defend its reproductive health so that um, uh, it would get pollinated and it would actually get spread, the seed would be spread around. Now, that was plants by themselves and fruits and vegetables by themselves. But when humans, you know, um, began picking those plants and putting them in our mouths and eating them, these same plant bioactives had another job description. They got another job, which is that they interacted not with plants and insects. They began interacting with human cells. And so this is what this is where food as medicine is coming from. It's not the hand wavy, you know, eat your kale, get your green juice. This is really about taking serious deep dive into looking at what Mother Nature has put into plants. I just want to show you something I, I call it sort of farm versus pharmacy. Um, this is an experiment that I did with my group, taking a look um, at the impact, the power of, of drugs, foods versus drugs. So this is actually a cell assay where um, if you go left to right, um, uh, if it's 100%, um, there's no effect. And if you actually had, and this is like on cancer cells uh, or blood vessel cells that are feeding cancers, and if you actually um, had a powerful drug, it would, it would make 
it would make fewer of the cells. So you can see drugs like captopril or lenalidomide are a little bit powerful. They, they, sh they shrink it down, um, the, the, the cells down a little bit. Um, doxycycline, which is an antibiotic, really makes the cells go down further. Arenatecan, which is a chemo drug, actually shrinks these cells way down, right? So this is basically, if you were in a biotech company, this is the kind of study that you would do. Well, so I decided that it was time to test food in the same systems that we actually develop drugs. So check it out what happened when I studied foods as medicines. Check it out. You can, you can see that in many cases, foods can hold up, hold their own side by side against drugs. And in some cases like garlic and soy and berry and parsley, um, they can actually beat the drug in the same test used to develop drugs. And so this is really, you know, we're entering this new era where we can really begin thinking about what foods are actually doing inside our body. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about when it comes to food and immunity. It's not just about which food, it's about what your body does with it. So let's talk about some of the foods that can actually help uh, immunity. Um, first of all, what is the immune system? Uh, I, you know, it's a really complicated subject and you know, in the yellow on the right hand side, I give me a list of the names of immune cells, T cells, NK cells, dendritic cells, B cells, macrophages, monocytes, myeloid cells, and there's also antibodies and many different kinds of antibodies. I don't wanna tell you anything about those because it's just too complicated and it would be, uh, you know, there are whole courses being taught on immunology. What I want to simplify it for you is look on the left-hand side. Think of your immune system as an army of super soldiers that are inside your body. And each type of super soldier actually is trained with its own special weapons, its own special visors and helmets to detect the enemies. And it is um, trained to actually tackle uh, bacteria and viruses and infections in their own way. And there's a lot of different kinds of soldiers, just like we have in the real military, we got, you know, the Marines, we got the Rangers, we got the Navy SEALs, we got the Air Force, we got the Navy. So that's similar to our immune system. Lots of different super soldiers are all trained. And, and their identities, if you had to put them on their name on a t-shirt would be some of the names on the right hand side. <clears throat> now, what are the foods that actually activate our immune super soldiers? So I'm just going to give you 10 things. Uh, in my book, Eat to Beat Disease, I write about 200 foods that activate all your body defenses, including the immune system. But I thought, you know, for the purposes of having something you could take home uh, as a, as a take-home message, something that you might want to try or put on a grocery list, just 10 things that you should eat um, in the COVID-19 era. If you, if you already love it, you're ahead of the game. If you haven't tried it, I would encourage you to try it. Okay, so uh, let's go through these. So the first thing is, um, Foods that contain vitamin C help immunity because we know that if you are deficient in vitamin C, your immune system goes down. So what does vitamin C do? It actually improves the barrier of your skin and in your mucous membranes. That's the mucus, the membrane of your nose, the mucous membrane in your mouth, and actually elsewhere. It actually helps defend the mucus against um, germs entering. It also helps our immune cells, the super soldiers, kill any microbes that try to get in. That includes viruses. And if there's any viruses that do get in and are killed, it helps to clean it up. So think about um, after a football game, you know, all the debris in the stands, right? You got the, the soda cups and you got the hot dog wrappers and everything else and the, uh, abandoned programs. So um, if there's a virus that's killed by the super soldiers, you got to clean the stadium. And so the immune system, vitamin C will also do that. The other thing that vitamin C does, it actually helps produce natural antibodies. And we, we hear a lot about antibodies and testing. Um, I, I'm happy to answer some questions about that if that comes up later, but we all have antibodies. And so, and some of these antibodies are just at the front gate of defense, front line of defense to pr protect us against um, anything that might try to get into our body. And of course, inflammation is something that's good because it actually is a signal we're destroying enemies. Um, but if it doesn't stop and it goes out of control, um, it's a problem. So think about inflammation like a campfire. It's really good, keeps you warm when you're camping, but if it goes out of control, it turns into a forest fire, um, which is with the cytokine storm, then it becomes a real problem and, and you can't put it out and that can, you can devastate uh, the entire uh, neighborhood. Vitamin C, good for immunity. So here's one of the foods that I, one of the top 10 foods is guava. 
you know, we always think about uh, oranges having vitamin C and they have good vitamin C, but guava's got like 10 times more vitamin C, really worth trying. It's a tropical food, fruit, great for the summer. You can make a juice out of it. You can eat it raw, slice it up. Um, you can actually cook with it in the Caribbean, lots of uh, great uh, 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 recipes. And what I love to do is actually take a food that I, you know, by the way, I, I really love food. So for me, it's fun researching and talking about food. If you take a food that you haven't tried before, or you're not really sure what to do with, um, uh, just type it into Google, look for recipe, find your favorite recipe site and, and take a look at it. Like a lot of these recipes are not that difficult to do. It gives you an opportunity to try something new that you just might love. And if you don't like guava, for whatever reason, another great source of vitamin C are tomatoes. And, you know, here are just a to show you the, the diversity of tomatoes in the summertime. The San Marzano tomato is an Italian tomato. The cherry tomato is like just packed with flavor. Um, these, um, uh, these darker black skin tomatoes are really interesting. They're a more recent appearance in our market. They're actually loaded with lycopene, so they have other reasons that they're really good. And the tangerine tomato, well, it looks like a tangerine, also um, has a form of lycopene, which is healthy uh, does a lot of things that lowers the risk of breast cancer and prostate cancer. Um, that's naturally um, really super available. Uh, uh, the lycopene is really super available for our body. So these are just some examples of really great tomatoes, um, uh, vitamin, a good source of vitamin C. Another um, great immune boosting food are mushrooms. Now, I happen to really love mushrooms and you can see, you know, this little um, dish in the center of white button mushrooms that are cut up and, and, and sauteed. Uh, you know, the, I call it the lowly button mushroom. Nobody used to think that they did much, but there have been research studies done in people showing that if you give a, a cup and a third of blanched mushrooms um, and serve it every single day, you can actually boost the antibodies um, that defend you in your mucus, like in your saliva and your nose um, uh, by several fold, um, which actually is, uh, is kind of like um, activating, it's like putting a guard, door, a guard dog um, inside your house in your hallway by the front door. That's a, that's a really good thing. What's even better is that if you love mushrooms, and I love mushrooms, you can use them in so many ways. You can slice up in the salad, you can saute them, you can cook them in a, the sauces, you can make a soup, you can make a stew. Um, a lot of things you can do with mushrooms. And if you wanted to know what would be the, um, um, uh, what's in a mushroom that's good, it's called beta d glucan. It's actually one of those natural bioactives. It's a part of the fiber. And then you say, well, there's so many mushrooms out there. What should I, which one should I choose? Which one's the what, most potent ones? The question I always ask. Well, it turns out this baby, this golden chanterelle mushroom that you can actually find in a lot of farmer's markets uh, in the summertime. And they can be small, they can be big. They're just really delicious to saute up um, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, I'd encourage you guys uh, to try it. Here's another food, um, broccoli, but not only the big broccoli uh, with the trees, but also broccoli sprouts. So what's really amazing is that, you know, in the summertime, uh, uh, farms are growing broccoli and uh, broccoli sprouts are three to four day old baby broccoli. And they have the same bioactives as the grown up broccoli, but at a hundred times more concentration. So the babies already are loaded with it. It's almost like as a broccoli plant goes bigger, uh, it's born with all the stuff it, it needs. And then it actually just gets uh, dispersed out in the big broccoli. The bro baby broccoli's taste, uh, the broccoli sprouts taste a little nutty. You can cut them up, you can put them on a, uh, on a salad, but it was a really interesting study. And that's what I'm showing you here, uh, done on North Carolina, where they took young people who were getting the flu vaccine. Uh, and you know, the flu vaccine, you, uh, there's a lot of different ways to get the flu vaccine. One of them, you can spray it up the nose if you don't want to get a shot. And they divided these young people into two groups. One group basically um, got broccoli sprouts, two cups, um, uh, pureed into a shake. And then, so they got the, they got the uh, flu vaccine and they drank the broccoli uh, sprout shake. And the other group just got basically a placebo drink, like no broccoli sprouts. And then they measured their immune natural killer cells. Remember I showed you that name, NK cells, natural killer cells, one of the super soldiers. Well, here's the thing that's amazing. Uh, in this human research, they found that people who were being immunized against the a flu had a 22 times increase in their natural killer cells if they had the vaccine along with a um, broccoli sprout shake. So this is not food versus medicine. This is food plus medicine making it work better. And then when they actually looked for the flu uh, uh, virus, um, 
and the patients in their nose, um, people who had the, the broccoli sprouts had zero detectable virus. And so really interesting. And uh, by the way, if you can't find broccoli sprouts or you don't like um, broccoli sprouts, the adult broccoli are just fine as well. By the way, uh, speaking about adult broccoli, most of us are trained to eat the trees, the treetops, okay? Um, uh, uh, those are called the florets. Um, but if you go to a farmer's market, you'll know that a broccoli is like basically a long stalk big long stalk like a club and with a little bit of a treetop on, on and, what, and most people take the stalk when they when we bring it home and they cut off the stalk and throw it away not, not but but actually it turns out that the stalk has twice as much of the good stuff as the trees do so the trees are good stalks are twice as bet good so cut them up saute them turn them into a soup or a smoothie there's all kinds of things you can do um, uh, to uh, to cook with broccoli sprouts again just look up google recipe and find your favorite site and find out something you can do with broccoli. And this is actually the results I'm telling you. 29 healthy volunteers, they got the nasal flu vaccine, 22 times more natural killer T cells, more killing power, fewer, less virus, flu virus. This to me is, is sort of food as medicine um, uh, at, at its best. Um, another food that you should consider um, that can boost your immunity in the COVID era is actually olive oil or olives. Um, and there's a natural substance of bioactive in olives called hydroxytyrosol. And, and you don't need to remember the names of these things. You just, you just have to enjoy the food and remember it's an olive. But hydroxytyrosol has been studied by scientists and it activates our T cells. It turns out, by the way, um, that more recent research uh, on COVID has found that not everybody makes antibodies or not everybody who makes antibodies have those antibodies sticking around against this virus, the COVID virus, the coronavirus. But the T cells seem to get trained against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so we don't wanna just focus all of our attention on antibodies. We wanna also think about our T cells the, the, the good stuff, the bioactives and olives are a great way to activate um, our T cells. Who wouldn't want to eat something like this, right? Blueberries, blackberries, um, they actually have a natural chemical called anthocyanin. And um, uh, th these also activate our natural killer cells. And studies have been done in young people, as, uh, again, looking at um, just people who had um, blueberries and they had powdered blueberries and they gave them a couple of cups to drink a day. And they had, and, and compared to people who did ha didn't have powdered blueberries, the people who had them, their immune system got ratcheted up, boosted. This is a human study. Blackberries and black raspberries also did something similar. And so again, you know, this is a great breakfast food. It's a summertime. It's time to add. These are in season. Think seasonally. Um, uh, uh, eat seasonally. Get fresh uh, food, foods. Um, you can take supplements, but, you know, honestly, the whole food's got a lot of these natural bioactives, and they just taste a lot better um, uh, as well. Now, here's a surprise that you might not have thought about uh, in food as medicine is oysters. Now, not everybody likes oysters, um, uh, but I can tell you uh, uh, that uh, in Asia, oysters are not, are not mostly eaten raw on the half shell like we have them in the United States and Europe. And when we go to a restaurant where, you know, some fancy restaurant where they have oysters on the half shell, they're always split open, they're on ice, and they have these little, you know, things of sauce you put on them. But honestly, in, in Asia, it's either cooked or if the oysters aren't perfectly um, uh, perfect ones uh, uh, for cooking, um, they're normally thrown away uh, in America. But in Asia, they cook them down into oyster sauce. And so researchers have actually shown that when you boil down oysters into this caramelized brown sauce, and that's basically what you get when you go to a Chinese restaurant and you order vegetables with brown sauce or chicken with brown sauce. That brown sauce is, is brown because it's made with oyster sauce. Oysters cooked down. And researchers have studied that cooked down oysters. And it turns out it actually boosts your immune system. And so in, in a laboratory, um, it actually enlarges the immune organs, your spleen, the thymus, and it actually doubles the power of uh, the killing power of the NK cells. Now, here's what's amazing. Like we were talking about viruses, but actually the immune system also kills cancer cells. Uh, some studies using boiled down oyster, oyster sauce, have shown that you can actually double the cancer killing power of, of, uh, of, of natural killer immune cells, and you can even reduce uh, the growth of tumors in the lab by about 50%, which is pretty amazing. So now, uh, you know, uh, I know people who would look at this picture and say, man, I, I would love to have the oysters. And some people say, you know, I, I really don't like the texture of oysters. I prefer not. I'm telling you, 
brown sauce in a Chinese uh, restaurant is usually oyster sauce. Um, lots of ways to actually combine oyster sauce with delicious foods, including, including green, dark green leafy uh, vegetables, which are also good for you and can also boost your immune system. Now, I'm going to actually just um, uh, close out by telling you a couple of um, super interesting facts that connect two health defense systems. Remember, we talked about all these different defense systems. Well, our immune system, which we just were talking about, actually is connected to our microbiome. So the microbiome is our healthy gut bacteria. And everybody knows, you know, have, has heard of the microbiome. It's the good bacteria that's in our gut. That's when you have yogurt, it's supposed to activate our good bacteria. When we have probiotics, they actually help feed our microbiome or prebiotics also do the same thing. But I want to kind of tell you what, how they're related. So if you think about your gut like a um, sprinkler hose, a lot, the lawn hose, um, there's a, it's, it's hollow in the middle and bacteria live there on the inside of the hose. Um, but if you didn't take, take a, cut the hose in half, and you'll see the wall of the hose is actually pretty thick. And inside the wall, we've now discovered that 70% of our immune system is actually located inside the wall of your gut, okay? And the bacteria is in the, the, the empty space, then there's the wall, and there's, about, and there's the immune system, and then there's the rest of the lining. Okay, so I always um, tell people to think about it like uh, like when you're in college and you're a roommate, um, uh, you had a thin wall, you could actually pound through the wall, or you could shout at your roommate through the wall and they would hear you. And that's what the, the healthy gut bacteria do. They actually communicate to the immune system. So the, the gut microbiome is a roommate, the thin wall of, of your college dorm is actually your gut. And just on the other side of that, inside the wall, is actually your immune cells, which is your roommate. And your, the gut bacteria, healthy gut bacteria, actually talk to the immune system and give them instructions on what to do to fight viruses, bacteria, and even cancer. And so we don't want to miss... Uh, uh, treat our gut bacteria. In fact, we want to do the opposite. We want to do good things for our gut uh, microbiome. And so um, this is 37 trillion bacteria. All right. This is like a whole ecosystem. Think about the Great Barrier Reef miniaturized and you swallow it and that's inside your gut. That's basically um, the, the diversity uh, of our bacteria that's, that's in there. And there are foods that have been shown to actually do good things for our gut microbiome. And one of them is actually pomegranate. And in fact, cancer researchers have shown that people who are able to eat pomegranate, there's a natural um, bioactive in there called elagitanins um, uh, that actually feed uh, uh, the gut uh, and, and the cells of the gut secrete mucus. And the kind of mucus that it secretes, which is normal healthy mucus, grows this bacteria called acromantia mucinophila. The mucinophila is because it likes to, the bacteria likes to grow mucus. This bacteria is a big time boost the immune system. And in fact, what, what cancer researchers found is that if you have pomegranate, it actually um, creates that mucus, uh, the bacteria grow, and when a bacteria grow, they actually talk through the wall and produce lots of immune cells. Okay, so these, these are kind of the guardians of the immune system, uh, this, this acromantia, and this, this is really how food can actually influence our gut bacteria, which then talks to our immune system and makes our immune system work even better. How much do you need to have a pomegranate juice? Yeah, not that much, about eight ounces or one glass of real pomegranate juice um, actually can actually do the trick to actually create more acromantia. All right, another um, uh, beverage you can actually drink is green tea. And everybody knows that green tea is good for your health. And I'm going to give you another reason to like green tea, uh, it, it, even you know if you're already a big fan. It turns out that the natural bioactive in green tea is called EGCG. It's called a catechin. But here's something new. Researchers have now found that green tea, the bioactive in it, actually um, feeds our healthy gut bacteria called lactobacillus. So another good guy, good bacteria in our gut is fed by green tea. And what does lactobacillus do? It doesn't actually only help create more immune cells. It helps your body actually make more interferon gamma. So what is interferon gamma? It's a virus killer. It's our body's killer. It's designed. It's like our bullet that our body makes to actually take out viruses. And so we want more of this now more than ever. And there was a study done um, uh, early in the pandemic in China where they took a, take a, look, took a look at people who had COVID-19 and had less serious illness. And they looked inside their gut 
to figure out what kind of bacteria they had. And, and the people who had less serious disease had more lactobacillus. Now, this isn't really the only answer yet, but it's an association that, 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 that was published by researchers. And then they took a look at what people were eating. Those people were eating with more lactobacillus. And it, guess what? They were drinking a lot of tea. That's the EGCG, the bioactive, feeding the gut bacteria, creating more interferon gamma, more virus killer, and helping to protect them. So again, th th this is not a prescription uh, to fight COVID, but this is really telling you what um, the COVID era has prompted us to ask these questions, to dive in, to say, what can we do for ourselves to minimize our risk, to strengthen our body, um, boost our defenses in any way that's possible? Um, Final one food I'll show you, by the way, that was number nine. This is number 10. Okay, one of my favorites are tree nuts and I love pecans. So I'm gonna show you a picture of pecans because you can actually use them in so many different ways. You can eat them as a snack, you can, salt, salt, you can roast them, uh, you can actually make them into a pie. And pecans have healthy fats, these are polyunsaturated fatty acids. These are omega-3 fatty acids. Um, uh, and uh, they also have a ton of dietary fiber. So what do both of these things do? The fiber and also the healthy fats? Guess what? They feed our, your gut bacteria. And one of the healthy gut bacteria they feed is called Ruminococcus. You don't actually have to remember the name of that bacteria. But what you need to know is that Ruminococcus also produces the virus killer, interferon gamma, which is a good thing. So, um, you know, if you're looking for a snack, don't reach for the junk food. Uh, reach for something that tastes great. Um, you can find uh, great recipes for pecans online. I was actually looking the other day. Um, and just know that this is another way to actually feed your gut bacteria, which will then talk to your immune system and actually produce virus killer. So I just gave you 10 foods, actually 11 if you count the tomato. Um, uh, and I write all about this in my book, Eat to Beat Disease. You can actually find more information about these foods uh, by following me on Facebook. I'm on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, 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 my handle is at, at Dr. William Lee. Or you can come to my website at drwilliamlee.com. Uh, there's a shopping list that you can download, a free shopping list if you sign up and, and get the information. Um, and it really, you know, this is what I'm really trying to do as part of my mission is to bring science, really complicated science to people because, you know, unlike medicines, which can take a decade to develop and they're really complicated and very expensive and they can have side effects, foods have immediacy and everybody can do something with a food because they got to make a decision three times a day. So I'll just close um, uh, before taking questions with this quote, one of my favorite quotes from B.B. King. And he said that the beautiful thing about learning is that nobody can take it away from you. And so what I hope I've shared with you are the things that I've learned about food as medicine in the COVID era and hopefully left you with some new ideas, new inspirations, and the desire to go out uh, to actually look for some recipes you can actually use uh, to eat to beat disease. Thank you. Dr. Lee, thank you so much. Once again, you've instilled hope in me. I got your book when I, uh, your, I followed you when I uh, was diagnosed with cancer and I got your book right away when it came out. And the first person I thought about when COVID-19 came out was you because I thought we, we don't know what to do and where do we have agency? And I think we have agency in, our, in the things we eat in our uh, bolstering of our immune system. So thank you so much personally and um, for on behalf of the webinar series. Um, I'd like to just take some questions that have been coming up. Um, somebody has asked, do you have any recommendations for a good cookbook? Using these foods sounds like a great uh, prophylaxis. Um, do you recommend anything? Uh, you know what? I, I, I Here's what I actually have found. I, I do have some favorite cookbooks, um, uh, um, but I'll tell you that the best thing that I think is out there is really the internet. Uh, because I, I, I think that every ingredient that I gave you can come in, it can be cooked in different ways according to different cultures. And if you like tomatoes and you want to do a Mediterranean style, there's all these great recipes out there. If you want to actually do it Asian style, there's even Asian recipes with tomatoes. And so I, I would, um, uh, rather than tell you, you know, like what are some of my favorite cookbooks? I mean, you know, like I, 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 Go, I used to go to the bookstore and just kind of uh, cruise down the cookbook aisle. And if there's something that appeals to me or somebody whose uh, dishes that I recognized or, you know, I would actually go with them. But I, I would say, don't close your mind here. Open your mind and really explore. And, you know, by the way, the other interesting thing to do is to ask, ask the people in your family. 
look for family favorites. That's always a great way to actually connect yourself your, with your food. Great, great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, there was a question about, uh, so maybe I'm going to combine a couple of questions. How much of these foods should you be eating? How regularly? And um, relatedly, what percentage of those bioactives does your body absorb? And like, for example, with EGCG and green tea, is there something you shouldn't eat with them or something that you should eat with them to make sure that they're bioavailable? Right. So uh, in my book, I've read a whole chapter called Food Doses. And the interesting thing about um, human studies, like I pointed out um, throughout you know, the last hour, is that some of the human researchers um, that have done this, like you can actually calculate the dose. So I told you a cup and a, a, cup and a third of blanched mushrooms uh, every day actually can get you this kind of um, natural killer cell result. Same thing with blueberries and same thing with broccoli sprout shakes. Um, so you can actually find the doses um, uh, that are out there. Uh, uh, more importantly, uh, what's important, uh, what, I, what I think I want to leave people with is that it's very important to eat diversely. You want to eat as many different kinds of foods that are healthy for you as possible. So it's not like, you know, Dr. Lee said mushrooms, I'm going to eat nothing but mushrooms or, you know, guava, I'm not going to, I'm only going to eat guava all day long. That's the kind of, um, ideology that sometimes happens, you know, in people well-intentioned people who are developing these extreme diets. You can't stick with them. Nobody can actually eat that many of the same food. And more, when it comes to food, more isn't always more. Diversity is really what you want to uh, actually have. So in my book, there's lots of, uh, there's a whole chapter of the food doses, and I actually list a number of different foods and their doses to get a particular effect. I'd encourage people to take a look at that. Uh, in terms of how your body absorbs things like EGCG um, or any of these other bioactives, um, the great news is that it can't outsmart mother nature. And, uh, and our bodies know exactly how much to absorb and then it kicks out the rest of it. Uh, so we never have to worry about overdosing on these bioactives. Um, they'll, they'll, our body will just el excrete, eliminate, not absorb anything it doesn't need. And that's actually the advantage over a drug. You inject something into your body or you, you know, swallow a pharmaceutical, that's in your body to, to stay until, you know, your liver or your kidney actually gets rid of it. You're, our gut is, knows how to actually take what it needs and then distribute the rest of it. And by the way, sometimes the rest of it goes to your gut bacteria that'll actually gobble it. What should you not eat? Because um, uh, you asked a lot of questions uh, uh, in one. Right. <laughs> um, uh, you shouldn't eat, listen, there's, there's, you should not eat things that are harmful to your gut bacteria. Okay, I just told you how important your gut bacteria is um, in communicating to your immune system. And uh, it's not like there's this food and you don't eat that. It's, it's more take good care of your gut bacteria. What are things that are bad for our gut bacteria? Well, it turns out that um, uh, artificial sweeteners are really bad for our gut bacteria. So, you know, the stuff that you'd find in uh, diet soft drinks, um, all it takes is for like one of those cans and you've like totally trashed your gut bacteria. It takes time for it to build back. And so the people that are taking these diet drinks every day, ironically, uh, even though it's supposed to have fewer calories, um, sometimes people, research has shown people will actually gain weight um, despite the fact they're on they're drinking diet sodas. And partly is because the gut bacteria that it kills, that it actually changes, um, that the bacteria that go away are the ones that actually help optimize their metabolism. And so again, uh, 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 it's better to actually uh, not to actually have these artificial um, sweeteners. The other thing are ultra, ultra processed foods. You know, the stuff that you've got, you got a million ingredients on that you can't pronounce. That's a, that's a, hallmark that's uh, of uh, of a um of a of an ultra processed food those also uh really hurt your gut bacteria so gut bacteria is so important i would say um take good care of them consider them your babies that live inside your body okay so sort of relatedly to to the gut um antibiotics how do you heal or restore your gut post antibiotics Right. Well, listen, antibiotics are sort of both uh, uh, 
the breakthrough, medical breakthrough of the 20th century, right? Because before that, people died from simple infections. But they're also the bane of our existence now because now they're being used everywhere. And until recently, we didn't even appreciate that they might be killing our healthy gut bacteria. Now we know that, okay? And in fact, if you have anti antibiotic-treated meats, um, some of those antibiotics will get into your body and they'll kill your gut, gut bacteria too. So you really got to be careful about, you know, choosing what we're putting into our bodies. Um, uh, it's really important to help our gut heal and continuously renew and ma make sure the ecosystem is happy for our gut bacteria. So fermented foods actually generally are good. So if you like sauerkraut, if you like kimchi, if you like pickles, if you like yogurt, um, frankly, even some cheeses, now cheeses have, a, have saturated fat and a lot of salt too, but even some cheeses actually can be a good source, particularly the soft cheeses um, or Parmesan Reggiano uh, has lactobacillus in it. Uh, uh, those are okay to eat, you know, like have a little bit of the stuff, um, uh, nibble on a little kimchi, you know, um, th those are things that actually help our gut bacteria recover and repair. Great. Oh, by the way, one last thing I got to tell you about the gut um, is good sleep. It's food can't do it all. You got to actually exercise regularly, lower your stress, but if you don't get good sleep, you're uh, uh, pulling all-nighters, you're, you're forcing your gut bacteria to pull an all-nighter too, and they don't like it. And so you, you sort of want to make sure you get good sleep, lower your stress as much as possible, um, exercise regularly. You don't have to work out, you just have to walk like 30 minutes a day. That level of activity is good enough, and then choose good foods that actually activate your body's health defenses. Great. Did you hear that, students? No pulling all-nighters. <laughs> Get your sleep. So I want to take us uh, back to food in some of the questions. Uh, how does preparation of those foods that you listed, does that matter whether you boil them or broil them or eat them raw? Does, does the state of the food and the cooking matter? Yeah, this is an area of research that I'm working on right now. Um, it turns out that you know, you would think that cooking a food would actually destroy some of the good stuff. Uh, you would think that storing a food a long time just um, uh, makes some of the good stuff go away. Well, not actually always true. So if you take, you know, a green vegetable and you boil it to death, yeah, you will actually destroy all the goodness. Like you take broccoli, an adult broccoli or even baby broccoli, if you like nuke it or you boil it. That's why boiling is the least effective way to actually cook your food. Um, uh, steaming is okay, but you don't want to steam too long either. You want to just kind of just cook it enough. Anything that's bright green, stop right there. Like that's before it turns as bright as it can. That's when you stop. It takes a little experience, um, but, but cooking actually can bring out some of the, the goodness as well. Tomatoes are a great example, although this is not true for vitamin C. It's, it's true for the lycopene. It turns out that the, the, when you cook tomatoes, you saute tomatoes like you would do for a tomato sauce. You actually gently change the chemistry of the lycopene of the tomato from a, from a, from a version, a chemical version your body doesn't absorb that well into one that your body loves to absorb. And if you do it with olive oil, um, since the lycopene is kind of fat soluble, uh, it'll actually dissolve into the olive oil and it'll get into your body, into your bloodstream a lot easier. So I just told you the Mediterranean diet secret, right? Olive oil, tomatoes, throwing a little garlic there. And now you've actually got some additional things I, I didn't show you, but uh, garlic and aged garlic also boost your immune system. Um, so uh, yeah, cooking um, uh, uh, can actually make a difference. Um, uh, I didn't have time to show you this, uh, uh, but potatoes also can influence your health uh, defenses. They, they actually kill cancer stem cells. And I know this is not a cancer talk, but i just should tell you some research that we've done. Turns out uh, tomatoes come out of the ground. They're in a truck shipped around. They sit in a dark place, you know, like in your basement or someplace cool. And guess what? The bioactives in the potato, the longer you store them, the more concentrated they actually get. And so, but you wouldn't know that unless you actually did the research. And that's why it's important to do that research. You can't just make an assumption cooking is bad. One thing I will tell, say that is not good to do is probably nuking. Uh, 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 foods to cook them because the water content of foods in the microwave get heated to a temperature that normally doesn't exist on earth. Like we, no, nothing gets that hot, okay? And so at that point, you're really changing the chemistry uh, of what's actually in the food itself. Well, yeah, it'll be hot, it'll still taste like that, but you, you know that consistency of nuked food is always a little bit different. So I would say 
you know, um, it's time to um, have some fun back in the kitchen, learn some good skills. Uh, and, and, you know, I think that's one of the upsides of this great pause that we've actually had during the pandemic is an opportunity to get to know the kitchen again. Great, great. Okay, so we have a lot of questions about different kinds of food. So let's play a little game. I'm going to say the name of the food and you're going to say yes or no, it's good for us. And I'm sure there's gray areas, but let's try it anyway. So dark chocolate. Great for us. Yay. Coffee? Great for us. Does it have to be organic? It's a great question. Um, I, I can tell you that it should be caffeinated because the decaffeination of coffee actually passes coffee beans through um, ether, which is a solvent. And in taking away the uh, caffeine, you're also removing some of the other bioactives. And so I would say the whole test coffee is actually the best stuff. Interesting. That's good for me. Honey um, and or sugar in relation to the microbiome? Sugar, the gut bacteria doesn't like a lot of sugar. So added sugar, not a good idea. Honey in small quantities is actually a natural form of sugar. It's sweet um, uh, and, um, and it doesn't seem to hurt the gut microbiome. Uh, in fact, bees eat their own honey, and it actually takes care of the microbiome in bees. So we're not bees, and our, our, system, our gut's different, and our bacteria are also different. Um, but, but I would say when it comes to sweeteners, no added, don't add sugar, no added sugar. Use natural sugars that occur in foods and don't make it any sweeter than it has to be. Um, and if you're going to add something like honey, which is a natural sweetener, or um, maple syrup is another thing that people add, um, add a little bit to it. Don't put a ton. How about chicory root? Chicory root. Um, that's a, a very specific food. Yeah. As there's a some prebiotic, good stuff in there. it says. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a, there's a lot of prebiotic in chicory root. That, that's actually been studied and it's actually, uh, it's really good. Now, chicory, uh, it's a, it opens up a whole uh, subject. Um, chicory, you can do a lot of things with chicory because you can actually cook with chicory or you can powderize chicory. You can even make it into a, a chicory coffee. Um, so yeah, there are, that's a good, that's a good probi prebiotic food. Yay. All right. There's a question here about emergency. Is it better to have emergency the powder form or should a bunch of berries be just as useful? You know, um, the reason all these supplements came about was because back in the 1800s, you know, and, and earlier, uh, people were genuinely deprived of food. They couldn't find fresh fruits often, or they might not be, uh, they might be expensive to get. And so they, there would be a lot of vitamin deficiencies because we had almost no real knowledge about nutrition back then, at least at the scientific level, uh, only intuitive knowledge. Um, today, we can, we can actually get lots of foods with vitamin C. And what I would encourage people to do is that if, you know, if you're, if you're not going to, it's always better to have the whole food because the whole food has got a lot more than vitamin C. You get more bang for your buck, you get more punch than, you know, uh, from a guava or an orange, than simply vitamin C. There's all these other great bioactives that do good things for your body. Uh, didn't have time to talk uh, to you about them. Um, but you know, like if you really just are not a citrus person or you don't like guava or you don't like anything with vitamin C, then, you know, I, I think the supplement is a good way to go. But, you know, there's, there's, I think what, we, what we're, for food as medicine and health, we want to really lean into our food as opposed to try to just simplify things and make it like just, you know, one and done. Great. Two more questions. Meat. Um, meat is a good source of protein, a good source of iron. So it's a micronutrient. Um, red meat has been found to be... Um, uh, harmful to your microbiome uh, and not good for your heart because mostly because of the saturated fats. But because of the, the new research in the microbiome shows that it actually alters the microbiome. In fact, one serving of meat, like one steak dinner, will change your microbiome overnight. And it takes a few weeks for it to actually recover. Now, it'll recover, so that's fine. So, you know, and, and, and I, I'm the kind of doctor that doesn't say you got to eat only plants, you got to eat only raw food. Look, <clears throat> life's for the living. So if you really spend most of your time eating good stuff, every now and then, if you want to have a steak or you want to have a burger, go for it. I would say at that point, don't go for the artificial burger that's made with all ultra processed food. Just get a really nice quality meat piece of meat. Don't have too much of it and, and really enjoy the heck out of it. Great. Uh, last question. Uh, this has to do with autoimmune disorders. Uh, what 
could eating this way or boosting the immune system, how does that interact with autoimmune disorders or, or any other disorders that would be impacted by food? Right. So uh, in my book, Eat to Be Disease, I actually write a whole chapter about um, foods that actually influence your immunity in lots of different ways. Um, a little inflammation is good, a little immune, uh, and, and enough immunity is, is necessary. But when your body actually starts to attack itself, that's autoimmunity. And that's where you are doing more damage to yourself. Uh, and that's bad. And oftentimes, the uh, hallmark of this, remember I gave you the analogy of the campfire versus the forest fire. Like campfire is easy to put out, right? You just kind of like kick some rocks or dirt over or you put, pour some water and it's done. The forest fire, you know, like it, it, it needs to burn out by itself. And even if you have a helicopter dropping things, it sometimes won't burn out for days or even weeks. Like in Australia we had um, last year. Uh, it can be a real problem. And that forest fire is inflammation because autoimmunity causes your body to be ultra hyper inflamed. The good news is that some of the same things that help to increase your immunity against diseases like viruses, like vitamin C, like green tea, actually not only boost the good parts, the viral fighting, the bacteria, the, the, the microbe fighting part of your immune system, also quells immunity. So this is a really complicated switch. Remember I told you the immune system is like an army of super soldiers, right? So what you don't want is the entire military going crazy, just, you know, firing all their weapons out at everybody. Like that's really bad. You don't want that. But, you know, um, there are certain instructions given by foods like with vitamin C or green tea that actually quell inflammation, but they still support the right type of immunity. And so in my chapter, I read a whole section about autoimmune foods and the research has been done in people with lupus and other autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis and showing which ones actually can actually boost, keep your immunity up. Like you don't want to shut your immunity off. You take a steroid, you can, actually, you can whap down your immunity and you become really vulnerable to any kind of infection. Not good. You want to actually just kind of um, uh, slow, it's, uh, think about the volume uh, on your radio or your car radio, right? You want to turn it so it's just right, not too loud, not too soft. And that's what some of these foods can do as well. Great. And that autoimmune section in your book is fantastic. I have somebody in my family who uh, has autoimmune disease and we've read it together. And so it's wonderful. Um, once again, I'd just like to thank you so much. I'm honored to be able to offer uh, this presentation to our college and so, so happy that you volunteered to do this uh, with us. Thank you um, uh, for, on behalf of my department and the college. Um, I think Malik is on now. Malik, are we going to, what are we doing next? Um, so one of the things we're going to do is we're going to have this uh, recording up as soon as we're able to have it up in a couple of days. Um, and you can go to oxy.edu slash matrix to see it. In the invitation you must have received, there is a link to Dr. Lee's website. Um, so if you didn't catch it, um, it's available, although it's quite easy to, to find. Um, he's everywhere. Um, and I think you said that we would have the PowerPoint available. Is that correct? Uh, uh, through the, through the pre-recording. Yeah. The pre-recording, perfect. Okay, and that's it. So thank you so much, Dr. Lee. That was extremely informative. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye.